Not a lot of applause for us. I know. Okay, I think we'll get started. Uh, thank you all so much for being here. There wasn't a lot of applause when we came on stage, so I guess you're here to see somebody else. <laughs> my name is Ben Wisner. I'm joined by my colleague Chris Segoyan from the ACLU. Uh, and maybe we can bring up on screen uh, the main attraction. Are we Hello. Awesome? All right. Uh, with his very clever green screen. Um, please bear with us today. The, the technology may have some kinks. The video may be a little bit choppy. Uh, our friend is appearing through seven proxies. Um, so if the video is a little slow, um, you're joining us for the event that one member of Congress from the great state of Kansas uh, hoped would not occur. Uh, he wrote to the organizers of South by Southwest, urging them to rescind the invitation to Mr. Snowden. Uh, the letter included this very curious line. Um, the ACLU would surely concede that freedom of expression for Mr. Snowden has declined since he departed uh, American soil. Uh, now, no one disputes that freedom of expression is stronger here than there, but if there's one person for whom that's not true, it's Ed Snowden. <laughs> um, if, if he were here in the United States, he would be in a solitary cell, subject probably to special administrative measures that would prevent him from being able to communicate to the public and participate uh, in the historic debate that he helped launch. Um, so we're really delighted to be here. One more bit of housekeeping, uh, as I'm sure most of you know, you can ask questions for Mr. Snowden on Twitter using the hashtag AskSnowden. Uh, some group of people backstage will decide which of those questions uh, we see here, and, and we'll try to leave uh, at least you know, 20 minutes or so um, for those questions. Um, so as I said, um, Ed Snowden's revelations and the, the courageous journalism of people like Bart Gelman, who you just heard, Glenn Greenwald, Laura Poitras, and others, uh, has really launched an extraordinary global debate. Um, but you might think of that debate as occurring over two tracks. Um, there is a debate in Washington, in the halls of power, about law and policy, about what democratic controls we need to rein in NSA spying, uh, that takes place in courts that are considering the legality the constitutionality of these programs uh, in the legislature, considering legislation. Um, but there's a very different conversation that you hear uh, in conference rooms in technology companies, particularly among people working on security issues. Uh, and those people are talking less about the warrant requirement for metadata uh, and more about why the hell the NSA is systematically undermining common encryption standards that we all use. Why is the NSA targeting uh, telecommunications companies, internet companies, hacking them uh, to, to try to steal uh, their customer data, basically manufacturing vulnerabilities to poke holes in the communication systems that we all rely on. Uh, we're hoping to mostly focus on that latter conversation here. Uh, and with that in mind, um, Ed, if you're with us, uh, maybe you could say a few words about why you chose for some of your first public remarks to speak to the technology community rather than, say, the policy community uh, in Washington? Well, thank you for the introduction. I would say uh, South by Southwest and the techno uh, technology community, the, the people who are in the room in Austin right now, uh, they're the folks who can really fix things, who can enforce our rights through technical standards even when Congress uh, hasn't yet gotten to the point of creating legislation to protect our rights in the same manner. Uh, when we think about what's happened with the NSA in the last decade in the post 9 11 era, uh, the result has been an adversarial internet, a sort of global free fire zone for governments that's nothing that we ever asked for 
It's not what we wanted. And it, it's something we need to protect against. When we think about the policies that have been advanced, the sort of erosion of Fourth Amendment protections, uh, the proactive seizure of communications, uh, there's a policy, policy response that needs to occur. But there's also a technical response that needs to occur. And it's the makers, it's the thinkers, it's the development community that can really craft those solutions and make sure we're safe. The, the NSA, the sort of global mass surveillance that's occurring in all of these countries, not just the US, and it's important to remember that this is a global issue, they're setting fire to the future of the internet. And the people who are in this room now you guys are all the firefighters, and we need you to help us fix this. So, Chris, you heard Ed say that the NSA offensive mass surveillance programs, the, the sort of manufacturing of vulnerabilities, is setting fire to the future of the Internet. You want to comment on that? Sure. Um, so many of the communications tools that we all rely on uh, are not as secure as they could be. Uh, particularly for the apps and services that are made by small companies and small groups of developers, security is often an afterthought, if it's a thought at all. Um, and really what that's done is enable global passive surveillance by the US, but other governments too. You know, what I think has been the most lasting impression for me from the last eight months is the fact that the, the real technical problems that the NSA seems to have are not how do we get people's communication? But how do we deal with the massive amounts of communications data that we're collecting? Um, the, the actual collection problem doesn't seem to be a bottleneck for the NSA, and that's because so many of the services that we're all relying on are not secure by default. Um, and so I really think for this audience, one of the things that, that we should be thinking about and, and hopefully taking home is, is the fact that we need to lock things down. We need to make services secure out of the box, and that's going to require a rethink by developers. It's going to require that developers start to think about security early on rather than later on down the road. Well, let, let me pick up on that. Um, Ed, um, you submitted written testimony last week to the European Parliament, uh, and I want to quote a very short part of that and have you elaborate on it. Uh, you said, in connection with mass surveillance, the good news is that there are solutions. The, weaken the weakness of mass surveillance is that it can very easily be made much more expensive through changes in technical standards. Um, what kinds of changes were you talking about, uh, and, and how can we uh, ensure that we make mass surveillance more expensive and less practical? Right, so the, the primary challenge that mass surveillance uh, faces from, from any agency, any government in the world, is not just how do you collect the communications as they cross the wires, as they sort of find their way through the global network, but how do you interpret them? How do you understand them? How do you break them back out and analyze them? And all of this is uh, at least on the easiest, the simplest, and most cost-effective basis by encryption. And there are, there are two methods of encryption that are generally used, and, and one of which is, is deeply problematic. One of those is what's called key escrow. Uh, it, it's sort of what we're using with uh, like Google type services, Skype type services right now, where I encrypt uh, a video chat and I send it to Google. Google decrypts it and then re-encrypts it to you guys and we have it. End-to-end -end encryption, where it's from my computer directly to your computer, makes mass surveillance impossible uh, at the network level without a crypto break, and they're incredibly rare, and they normally don't work, and they're very expensive. Uh, by, by doing end-to-end -end encryption, you force uh, what are called the threat model, threat model uh, global passive adversaries, to go for the endpoints, that is the individual computers. And the result of that is a more constitutional, more uh, carefully overseen sort of uh, intelligence gathering model, law enforcement model, where if they want to gather somebody's uh, communications, they have to target them specifically. They can't just target everybody all the time and then when they want to read your stuff, they go back in the time machine and they say, what did they say, you know, in 2006? They can't pitch exploits at every computer in the world without getting caught. 
That's the value of end-to-end -end encryption, and that's what we need to be thinking about. We need to go, how can we enforce these protections in a simple, cheap, and effective way that's invisible to users? And I think that's the way to do it. So, Chris, one of the obstacles to widespread end-to-end -end encryption is that many of us get our email service from advertising companies that need to be able to read the emails in order to serve us targeted ads. But, but what are steps that even a company like Google that's an advertising company or companies like that uh, can do to make mass surveillance more difficult? Are there things or do we really need new business models to, to accomplish what Ed is talking about? I mean, in the last eight months, um, the big S Silicon Valley technology companies have really uh, improved their security in, in a way that was surprising to many of us who have been urging them for years to do so. Um, you know, it really took Yahoo. Uh, uh, Yahoo was kicking and screaming the whole way, but they finally turned on SSL encryption in January of this year uh, after Bart Gelman and Ashkan Sultani shamed them on the front page of the Washington Post. Uh, the companies have locked things down, but only in a certain way. They've secured the connection between your computer and Google's server or Yahoo's server or Facebook's server, um, which means that governments have to now go through Google or Facebook or Microsoft to get your data instead of getting it with AT&T's help or Verizon's help or Comcast or any party that watches the data as it goes over the network. Uh, I think it's going to be difficult for these companies to offer a truly end-to-end -end encrypted service simply because it conflicts with their business model. Right? Google wants to sit between you and everyone you interact with and provide some kind of added value, whether that added value is advertising or you know, some kind of uh, uh, information mining, um, I improved experience, telling you when there are restaurants nearby where you can meet your friends. They want to be in that connection with you, um, and that makes it difficult to secure those connections. But is, th is this the right time for a shout out to Google that is in this conversation with us right now? So, so look, the, the <laughs> irony that we're using Google Hangouts to talk to Ed Snowden <laughs> has not been lost on, on me or uh, our team here. And I should be clear, you know, we're not getting any advertising support from, from Google here. The, the fact is, is that the tools that exist to enable secure end-to-end -end encrypted video conferencing are not very polished. And um, particularly when you're having a conversation with someone who's in Russia and who's bouncing his connection through several proxies, um, the secure communications tools tend to break. And, and this, in fact, I think reflects the state, of, the state of play with many services. You have to choose between a service that's easy to use and reliable and polished, or a tool that is highly secure and impossible for the average person to use. And I think that, that reflects the fact that the services that are developed by large companies with the resources to put 100 developers on the user interface, those are the ones that are not optimized for security. And the tools that are designed with security as the first goal are typically made by independent developers and activists and hobbyists. And they're typically tools made by geeks for geeks. And so what that means is the world, the regular users have to pick. They have to pick between a service they cannot figure out how to use or a service that is bundled with their phone or bundled with their laptop and works out of the box. And of course, rational people choose the insecure tools because they're the ones that come with the devices they buy and work and are easy for people to figure out. Well, well let's bring Ed back into this because uh, in a way, this whole affair began with Glenn Greenwald not being able to use PGP. Um, which is somewhat of a joke in the tech community, but really not outside the tech community. PGP is not easy to install, and it's not easy to use. Um, using Tor, using Tails, um, I you know, I feel like I need new IT support in my office just to be able to do this work. So, um, you know, you're you're addressing an audience that includes uh, a lot of young technologists. Um, is there a call to arms for people to make this stuff more usable? Uh, so that not only technologists can use it? There is, and I think you're actually seeing a lot of progress being made here. Uh, Whisper Systems, the sort of Moxie Marlin spikes of the world, are focusing on new uh, user experiences, new UIs, uh, and, and basically ways for us to interact with uh, cryptographic tools. And this is the way it should be. Where it happens invisibly to the user, it happens by default. Right? We want secure services that aren't opt-in. It's got to pass the Greenwald test. You know, if uh, any journalist in the world gets an email from somebody saying, hey, I have something that the public might want to know about, uh, they need to be able to open it. They need to be able to access that information. They need to be able to have those communications, whether they're a journalist or an activist 
or even your grandma. You know, this is something that people have to be able to access. And really, the way we interact with it right now is, is not good. You know, if you have to go in the command line, people aren't going to use it. If you have to go three menus deep, people aren't going to use it. It has to be out there, it has to happen automatically, and it has to happen seamlessly. And that's within reach. So who are we talking to, Chris? Are we talking now to technology companies? Are we talking to foundations to, to support the development of more usable security? Are we talking just to developers? Who's the audience for this call to arms? I mean, I think the audience is everyone. But we should understand that most regular people are not going to go out and download an, an obscure encryption app. Most regular people are going to use the tools that they already have. That means they're going to be using Facebook or Google or Skype. Um, and so a lot of our work goes into pressuring those companies to protect their users. In January of 2010, Google turned on SSL, the lock icon in your web browser. They turned it on by default for Gmail. It had previously been available, but it had been available through an obscure setting, the 13 of 13, 13, of 13 configuration options. And of course, no one turned it on. When Google turned that option on, suddenly they made passive bulk surveillance of their users' communications. Uh, far more difficult for intelligence agencies. And they did so without requiring that their users take any steps. One day, their users just logged into their mail, and it was secure. And that's what we need. We need services to be building security in by default and enabled without any advanced configuration. Now, that doesn't mean that small developers cannot play a role. There are going to be you know, hot new communications tools. Things, you know, WhatsApp basically came out of nowhere a few years ago. And what I want is for the next WhatsApp or, or the next um, Twitter to be using encrypted end-to-end -end communications. This can be made easy to use. This can be made usable. But you need to put a team of, of user experience developers on this. You need to optimize. You need to make it easy for the average person. A and you know, if you're a startup uh, and, you're, and you're working on something, bear in mind that it's going to be more difficult for the incumbents to deliver secure communications to their users because their business models are built around advertising supported services. You can more effectively and, and more easily deploy these services um, than they can. And so I think if you're looking for an angle here, I think we're, we're slowly getting to the point where telling your customers, hey, $5 a month for encrypted communications, no one can watch you. Um, I think that's something that many consumers might be willing to pay for. So if I could actually uh, piggyback on that real quick, one of the things I want to say is for the larger company, it's not that you can't collect any data. It's that you should only collect the data and hold it for as long as necessary for the operation of the business. Recently, EC Council, one of the security certification providers, was hacked. Uh, and they actually stole my passport, a copy of my passport, my registration forms, uh, and posted them to the internet when they could face the site. Now, I submitted those forms back in 2010. Why was that still on web-facing server? Was it still necessary for the business? That's a good example of why these things need to age off. And whether you're Google or Facebook, you can do these things in a responsible way where you can still get the value out of these that you need to run your business in a free or ad support manner without putting your users in risk. So we didn't have great audio here on that response, but, but what Ed was saying is that even companies whose business model relies on them to collect and aggregate data don't need to store it indefinitely once its primary use has been accomplished. His example was uh, that some company was hacked, and, and they found some of his data from four years ago that clearly there was no business reason for them still to be holding on to. Let's switch gears a little bit. Um, last week, Ed, uh, General Keith Alexander, who heads the NSA, um, testified that he believes that the disclosures of the last eight months um, have weakened the country's cyber defenses. Um, uh, some people might think there's a pot in the kettle problem coming from him, but, but what, was, what was your response to that testimony? So it's very interesting to see officials like Keith Alexander talking about damage that's been done to sort of the defense of our communications. Because more than anything, there have been two officials in America who have harmed our internet security and actually our national security because so much of us, so much of our country's economic success is based on our intellectual property. It's based on our ability to create and share and communicate and compete. Now, those two officials are Michael Hayden 
and Keith Alexander, two directors of the National Security Agency in the post 9-11 era, who made a, a very specific change. And that is they elevated offensive operations, that is attacking over the defense of our communications. They began eroding the protections of our communications in order to get an attack advantage. Now, this is a problem for uh, uh, one primary reason, and that's America has more to lose than anyone else when every attack succeeds. When you are the country, the one country in the world who has sort of a vault that's more full than anyone else's, it doesn't make any sense for you to be attacking all day and never defending your full vault. And it makes even less sense when you set the standards for vaults worldwide to have a big back door that anybody can walk in through. And that's what we're running into today. So when he says, you know, these things have weakened national security, now these are improving our national security. These are improving the communications, not just of Americans, but everyone in the world, because we rely on the same standards. We rely on the ability to trust our communications. And without that, we don't have anything. Our economy cannot succeed. So Chris, uh, Richard Clark testified a few weeks back that it's, it's more important for us to be able to defend ourselves against attacks from China than to be able to attack China um, uh, using our cyber tools. Um, I don't think everybody understands that there is any tension whatsoever between those two goals. Um, uh, are, why are they in opposition to each other? As, as a country, um, we have public officials testifying in Washington saying that cybersecurity is the greatest threat this country now faces, greater than terrorism. We've had both the director of the FBI and the director of national intelligence uh, t say this in testimony to Congress. And I think it's probably true that we do, in fact, face some kind of a cybersecurity threat. I think that our systems are not as safe as they could be, and, and we are all vulnerable to, um, to compromise in one way or another. But what should be clear is that this government isn't really doing anything to keep us secure and safe. This is a government that has prioritized for offense rather than defense. Um, you know, if there were a 100% increase in murders in Baltimore next year, the chief of police of Baltimore would be fired. If there is a 100% increase in phishing attacks, successful phishing attacks where people's credit card numbers get stolen, no one gets fired. Um, as a country, we have basically been left to ourselves. We've, every individual person is left to defend themselves online, and the government has been hoarding information about information security vulnerabilities. In some cases, it, uh, you know, there, has, there was a disclosure in the New York Times or a report in the New York Times last fall revealing that NSA has been partnering with U.S. technology companies to intentionally weaken the security of the software that we all use and rely on. And so the government has really been prioritizing its efforts on information collection. And, and there is this fundamental conflict. There's a tension, which is that a system that is secure is, diff is difficult to surveil, and a system that is designed to be surveilled is a target waiting to be attacked. And our networks have been designed with surveillance in mind. We need to prioritize cybersecurity, and that's going to mean making surveillance more difficult. Uh, and of course, the NSA and, and their partners in the intelligence world are, are not crazy about go us going down that path. So, so Ed, um, if the NSA is willing to take these steps that actually weaken security, that spread vulnerabilities, that, that uh, make it, in some sense, easier, not just for us to do surveillance, but for others to attack, uh, they must think there's an awfully good reason for doing that. Uh, that there are bulk collection programs uh, that, that these activities facilitate, the collect it all mentality, uh, that it really works, uh, that this is a very, very effective surveillance method in, in keeping us safe. So, you know, you sat on the inside of these systems uh, for, for longer than people realize. Um, do these mass surveillance programs do what our intelligence officials promised to Congress that they do? Are they effective? They're not. Um, that's actually something that I'm a little bit sympathetic to because we've got to turn back the clock a little bit and remember that they thought this was a great idea, but no one had ever done it before, at least publicly. So they went, hey, we can spy on everybody in the world all at once. It'll be great. We'll know everything. But the reality is when they did it, they found out it didn't work. But it was such a good form. It was so successful and successful. 
securing funding. It was so great to get new billets. It was so great to win new contracts that nobody wanted to say no. But the reality is now we've reached a point where the majority of Americans' telephone communications are, are being recorded. We've got all this metadata that's being stored for years and years and years. But two independent White House investigations have found it has no value at all. It's never helped us. Beyond that, we've got to think about what are we doing with those resources? What are we getting out of them? And as I said in my uh, European Parliament testimony, we've actually had tremendous intelligence failures because we're monitoring the internet. We're monitoring you know, uh, everybody's communications instead of suspects' communications. And that lack of focus has caused us to miss leads that we should have had. Tamerlan Sarnay of the Boston bombers. The Russians had warned us about it, but we did a very poor FBI investigation because we didn't have the resources, we had people looking at other things. And if we hadn't spent so much on mass surveillance, if we followed the traditional models, we might have caught that. Uh, Umar Farouk Mubtalib, the underwear bomber, same thing. His father walked into a U.S. embassy. He went to a CIA officer. He said, my son is dangerous. Don't let him go to your country. Get him help. We didn't follow up. We didn't actually investigate this guy. We didn't de dedicate a team to figure out what was going on because we spent all of this money. We spent all of this time hacking into Google and Facebook's backends to look at their database, uh, their data center communications. What did we get out of that? We got nothing, and two White House investigations have confirmed that. Chris, if, as Ed says, these bulk collection programs uh, are not all that effective, that the, the resources that, that go into this would be better directed uh, at targeted surveillance, um, why are they dangerous? Why are they, why are they dangerous? Because the government is collecting, uh, uh, has created this massive database of everyone's private information. The, in an NSA building, somewhere probably in, in Maryland, there is a record of everyone who's called an abortion clinic, everyone who's called an Alcoholics Anonymous hotline, everyone who's called uh, a gay bookstore. Um, and they tell us, don't worry, we're not looking at it or we're not looking at it in that way. We're not doing those kinds of searches. But I think many Americans you know, would, would have good reason to not want that information to exist. I think regardless of which side on the political spectrum you are, you probably don't want the government to know that you're calling an abortion clinic or calling a church or calling a gun store. Uh, and, and you may think quite reasonably that that is none of the government's business. Um, and so I, I think when you, when you understand that the government can collect this information at this scale, they can hang on to it and figure out uses for it down the road. Uh, you know, I, I think many Americans are, are quite fearful of this slippery slope, uh, this surveillance that happens behind closed doors. And even if you trust the administration that we have right now, you know, the, the person who sits in the Oval Office changes every few years. And you may not like the person who's going to sit there in a few years with that data that was collected today. Um, Ed, we lost you for a moment, but can you still hear us? I can hear you. Okay. Um, just before this began, uh, I got an email from Sir Tim Berners-Lee, the creator of the World Wide Web, who, who asked for the privilege of the first question to you, and, and I think I'm willing to extend that to him. Uh, <laughs> uh, he wanted to thank you. He believes that your actions have been profoundly in the public interest. Thank you. That was applause, if you couldn't hear it. Um, and he asks, if you could design from scratch an accountability system for, for governance uh, over national security agencies, you know, what would you do? Uh, it's clear that intelligence agencies are going to be using the internet to collect information from all of us. Uh, is there any way that we can make oversight more accountable and improved? You know, that, that's a really interesting question. It's also a very difficult question. Oversight models, auditing models, these are things that are very complex. They've got a lot of moving parts. And when you add in secrecy, when you add in public oversight, it gets complex. We've got a good starting point, and that's what we have to remember. We have an oversight model that could work. 
The problem is when the overseers aren't interested in oversight, when we've got, uh, when we've got Senate Intelligence Committees, House Intelligence Committees that are cheerleading for the NSA instead of holding them to account. When we have James Clapper, the Director of National Intelligence, in front of them, and he tells a lie that they all know is a lie because they're briefed on the program, because they got the questions, you know, a day in advance, and no one says it, allowing all the American people to believe this is a true answer, that's an incredibly dangerous thing, and that's the biggest failure. So when I would say, how do we fix our oversight model? How do we structure an oversight model that works? The key factor is accountability. We can't have officials like James Clapper who can lie to everyone in the country, who can lie to the Congress, and face no, not even, not even a criticism, not even a strongly worded letter. Uh, the same thing with courts. In the United States, we've got open courts that are supposed to decide and settle constitutional issues to interpret and apply the law. We also have the FISA court, which is, which is a secret rubber stamp court, but they're only supposed to approve warrant applications. These happen in secret because you don't want people to know, hey, the government wants to surveil. At the same time, a secret court shouldn't be interpreting the Constitution when only NSA's lawyers are making the case about how it should be ruled on. Those are the two primary factors that I think need to change. The other thing is we really need public advocates. We need public uh, representatives. We need public oversight, some way for, for trusted public figures, sort of civil rights champions, to, to advocate for us and to protect the structure and make sure it's being fairly applied. We need a watchdog that watches Congress, something that can tell us, hey, these guys didn't tell you that you were just lying to them. Because otherwise, how do we vote? If, if we're not informed, we can't consent to these policies, and I think that's dangerous. Uh, for what it's worth, my answer to Sir Tim is Ed Snowden. Uh, before these disclosures, all three branches of our government had gone to sleep on oversight. Uh, the courts had thrown cases out, as he said. Uh, Congress allowed itself to be lied to. The executive branch did no reviews. Uh, since Ed Snowden and since all of us have been read in to these programs, uh, we're actually seeing reinvigorated oversight. Uh, it's the oversight that the Constitution had in mind, uh, but sometimes it needs a dusting off, and, and, and Ed uh, has been the broom. So, you want to Yeah, I just wanted to, to also note that without Ed's disclosures, many of the tech companies would not have improved their security, either at all or at the rate that they did. Um, the PRISM story, although there was a lack of clarity initially about what it really said, put the names of billion-dollar American companies on the front page of the newspaper and associated them with bulk surveillance. And you saw the companies doing everything in their power publicly to distance them themselves, distance themselves and also show that they were taking security seriously. You saw companies like Google and Microsoft and Facebook rushing to encrypt their data center to data center encryption. Um, you saw uh, the connections, rather. You saw um, companies like Yahoo finally turning on SSL encryption. Uh, Apple fixed uh, a bug in its um, address book app that allowed Google users' address books to be transmitted over networks in unencrypted form. Without Ed's disclosures, there wouldn't have been as much pressure for these tech companies to encrypt their, their, their information. Now, there are going to be people in this audience and there will be people who are listening at home who think that what Ed did is wrong. But let me be clear about one really important thing. His disclosures have improved internet security. <laughs> and, and the security improvements we've gotten haven't just protected us from bulk government surveillance. They've protected us from hackers at Starbucks who are monitoring our Wi-Fi con uh, uh, wi connections. They've protected us from stalkers and identity thieves and common criminals. These companies should have been encrypting their communications before, and they weren't. And it really took, you know, unfortunately, the largest uh, and most profound whistleblower in history 
uh, to get us to the point where these companies are finally prioritizing the security of their users' communications between them and, and, and the companies. But we all have Ed to thank for this. And, and I, I really just cannot emphasize enough, without him, we would not have Yahoo users getting SSL. We would not have this data going over the network in encrypted form. Um, it shouldn't have taken that. The company should have done it by themselves. There should be regulation or, 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 or privacy regulators who are forcing, forcing these companies to do this. But that isn't taking place. And so it took Ed to get us to a secure place. Uh, remember, the hashtag is Ask Snowden. Uh, we'll take our first question. Please forgive pronunciations from Max Zirkenden. The question for Ed uh, and Chris, too. Why is it less bad if big corporations get access to our information instead of the government? Ed, did you hear it? Yes, I, I did. So this is something that's actually been debated, and we see people's opinions, people's sort of responses to this evolving, which is good. This is, this is really why we need to have these conversations, because we don't know. Right now, my thinking, and I believe the, the majority's thinking, is that the government has the ability to deprive you of rights. Governments around the world, whether it's the United States government, whether it's the Yemeni government, whether it's, you know, Zaire, uh, any, any country, uh, they have police powers, they have military powers, they have intelligence powers, they can literally kill you, they can jail you, they can surveil you. Companies can surveil you to sell your products, to sell your information to other companies, and that could be bad, but you have legal rights. Uh, first off, it's typically a voluntary contract. Secondly, you've got court, uh, court challenges from these. If you challenge the government about these things, and, and the ACLU itself actually has challenged some of these cases, uh, the government throws it out on state secrecy and says, you can't even ask about this. The courts aren't allowed to tell us whether this is legal or not, because we're just going to do it anyway. That's the difference, and it's something we need to watch out for. Chris, do you want to address it? Should we take the next question? Sure. Uh, just quickly, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not crazy about the amount of data that Google and, and Facebook collect. Um, of course, everything they get, the government can come and ask for, too. So there's the collection that the government is doing by itself, and then there's the data that they can go to Google and Facebook and force them to hand over. Um, but we should remember that the web browser that you're likely using, the most popular browser right now is, is Chrome. Um, the most popular mobile, uh, mobile operating system is now Android. Many of the tools that we're using, whether web browsers or operating systems or apps, are made by advertising companies. And it's not a coincidence that Chrome is probably a less privacy-preserving browser. It, it's tweaked to allow data collection by third parties. The Android operating system is designed to facilitate the disclosure of data to third parties. Um, and so even if you're OK with the data that the companies are collecting, we should also note that the tools that we use to browse the web and the tools that ultimately will either permit our data to be shared or pre prevent it from being shared are made by advertising companies. And this makes the NSA's job a lot easier. If the web browsers we were using are, were locked down by default, the NSA would have a much tougher time. But advertising companies are not going to give us tools that are privacy preserving by default. Let's take another question from Jody Serrano to Snowden from Spain. Do you think the US surveillance systems might encourage other countries to do the same? Yes, this is actually one of the, the primary dangers, uh, not just of sort of the NSA's activities, but of not addressing and resolving these issues. It's important to remember that Americans benefit profoundly from this because, again, as we discussed, we've got the most to lose from being hacked. At the same time, every citizen in every country has something to lose. We all are at risk of unfair, unjustified, uh, unwarranted interference in our private lives. Throughout history, we've seen governments sort of repeat the trend where it increases and it gets to a point where they cross the line. If we don't resolve these issues, if we allow the NSA to continue unrestrained, every other government, the international community, will accept that sort of as the green light to do the same. And that's not what we want. 
I mean, I think there is a difference between surveillance performed by the NSA and surveillance performed by most other governments. And it's not really a legal one, it's more of a technical one, and that is the whole world sends their data to the United States. Americans are not sending their email to Spain, Americans are not sending their photographs to France. Uh, and so this means that the US, because of Silicon Valley, because of the density of tech companies in this country, the US enjoys an unparalleled intelligence advantage that every other government just doesn't have. Um, and if we want the rest of the world to keep using US tech companies, if we want the rest of the world to keep trusting their data to the United States, then we need to respect them. We need to respect their privacy in the way that we protect the privacy of Americans right now. Um, and I think the revelations of the past eight months have given many people in other countries very, a very reasonable um, reason to, to question whether they should be trusting their data to United States companies. And, and I think we can, if we can get that uh, trust back through legal changes, but I think tech companies can also do a lot to earn that trust back by employing encryption and other privacy protecting technologies. The, the best way to get your users trust is to be able to say when the government comes to you, sorry, we don't have the data, or sorry, we don't have the data that's gonna be in a form that will be of any use to you. That's how you win back the trust of people in Brazil and in Germany and, uh, and people around the world. So let me just cut in with a question here because I do think that um, a certain degree of perhaps hopelessness may have crept in to, uh, to the global public with this just constant, constant barrage of stories about the NSA's capabilities, the GCHQ's capabilities and their activities, um, all the ways that they're able to, 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 uh, to get around defenses. But I hear Chris, you and Ed both coming back to encryption again and again um, as, as something that still works. So maybe we could just take a moment, Ed, um, you know, after the discussions that we've had about how, how NSA has worked to weaken encryption. Um, you know, should people still be confident um, that the basic encryption that we use protects us from surveillance or at least mass surveillance? Right, the, the bottom line, and I've, I've repeated this again and again, is that encryption does work. We need to think about encryption not as this sort of arcane black art, but sort of a basic protection. It's the defense against the dark arts from the digital realm. And this is, a, this is something we all need to be not only, uh, not only implementing, but actively researching, improving on the academic level. Sort of the, the grad students of today and tomorrow need to keep today's threat on our mind to inform tomorrow's. You know, we need all those brilliant Belgian cryptographers to go, all right, we know that these encryption algorithms we're using today work. Typically, it's the random number generators that are attacked as opposed to the encryption algorithms themselves. How can we make them provable? How can we test them? And this is a hard problem. It's, it's not going to go away tomorrow. But it's the steps that we take today. It's the moral commitment, the philosophical commitment, the commercial commitment to protect and enforce our liberties through technical standards that's going to take us through the moral and allow us to reclaim the open and trusted internet. Chris, very briefly, you, you hang out with cryptographers. They're not happy campers these days. No. Um, you know, of, of all the stories that have come out, the one that has really had the biggest impact in, in the security community is the story, um, is the news that the NSA has subverted the design of cryptographic and random number generator algorithms. Um, I think it's fair to say th that there, are, there is an, uh, a group within the cryptographic community now who have become radicalized as a result of, um, of these disclosures, and cryptographers actually can be radicals. They're, they're not just mild-mannered people. Um, we should remember that regular consumers do not pick their own encryption algorithms. Regular consumers just use the services that are provided to them. The people who pick the crypto, who pick the particular algorithms, who pick the key sizes, they are the security engineers at Google and Facebook and Microsoft and the cryptographers who are working with open source projects. And those people are all really pissed. Um, and, and I think that's good. Those people should be mad, but, and those people can make, make a difference. And the fact that these disclosures have so angered the security community, I think, is a really good sign because ultimately the tools that come out in six months or a year or two years are going to be far more secure than they were before, and that's because that part of the tech community uh, feel like they were lied to. So let's take a couple more questions from Twitter. Uh, Melissa Nixick, I hope. Uh, 
What steps do you suggest the average person take now to ensure a, mu a more secure digital experience? Uh, is there anything that we can do at the individual level uh, to confront the, the issues of mass surveillance that we're talking about today? Um, Ed, it's okay if the answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> no there, there are basic steps. It's a really complicated uh, subject matter today. And that's the difficulty. Again, it's the Glenn Greenwald test. How do you answer this for someone? Um, for me, there are a couple of key technologies. There's full disk encryption to protect your actual physical computer and devices in case they're seized. Uh, then there's network encryption, which are things like SSL, but that happens sort of transparently. You can't help that. You can install a couple of browser plugins, um, no script to block uh, active exploitation attempts in the browser, ghostery to block ads and tracking cookies. Uh, but there's also Tor. Tor, T-O-R, uh, is a mixed routing network, which is very important because it's encrypted uh, from the user through the ISP to the end of sort of a, a, a Tor cloud, a network of routers that you go through. Uh, and because of this, your ISP, your telecommunications provider, can no longer spy on you by default, the way they do now, today, when you go to any website. By using Tor, you shift their focus to either attacking the Tor cloud itself, which is incredibly difficult, or to try to monitor the exits from Tor and the entrances to Tor, and then try to figure out what fits. And that's very difficult. If you take those basic steps, you encrypt your hardware and you encrypt your network communications, uh, you're far, far more hardened than the average user. I mean, it becomes very difficult for any sort of a mass surveillance to be applied to you. You'll still be vulnerable to, to targeted surveillance. If there's a warrant against you, if the NSA is after you, they're still going to get you. But mass surveillance, this untargeted, collected all approach, you'll be much safer. You know, when there's a question about average users and the answer is Tor, um, we failed. We failed, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I, I'll just add to, to what Ed said in saying that a privacy-preserving experience may not be a secure experience and vice versa. So I, I'm constantly torn. I personally feel like Firefox is the more privacy-preserving browser, but I know that Chrome is the more secure browser. And so I'm stuck with this choice of am, am I more worried about passive surveillance of my communications and my web browsing information, or am I wor more worried about being attacked? Um, you know, and I, I go back and forth on, on those. I think until we have a browser or a piece of software that, that optimizes for both privacy and security, I think users are going to be sort of stuck with, it, with uh, two bad choices. Um, I'll, I'll just note that in addition to, to what Ed said, uh, I mean, I really think that consumers need to rethink their relationship with many of the companies to whom they entrust their private data. And, and I, I really think what this comes down to is if you're getting the service for free, the company isn't going to be optimizing the experience uh, with, with your best interest in mind. I'm not going to say, you know, if you're not paying for the product, you are the product because we pay for our telephone call. We pay for our wireless service, and those companies still treat us like crap. Um, but, you know, if you want a secure online backup service, you're going to have to pay for it. If you want a secure voice or video communications product, you're going to have to pay for it. And that doesn't mean you have to pay thousands of dollars a year, but you need to pay something so that that company has a sustainable business model that doesn't revolve around collecting and monetizing your data. Um, OK, we have another question about encryption uh, from Sean. Uh, isn't it just a matter of time before NSA can decrypt even the best uh, encryption? Uh, and Ed, I'm particularly interested in uh, your answer to this in light of your confidence um, that you know, data that you were able to, to take is secure and has remained secure. Well, let's put it this way. The, the United States government uh, has assembled a massive investigation team into me personally, into my work with the journalists, and they still have no idea you know, what, uh, what documents were provided to the journalists, what they have, what they don't have, because encryption works. Now, the only way to get around that, even over time, is you either have a computer that's so massive and so powerful, you convert the entire universe 
into the energy power of sort of this crypto breaking machine, and it still might not have enough to do it. Or you can break into the computers and try to steal the keys and bypass that encryption. And that happens today. That happens every day, and that's the way around it. Now, there are still ways to protect encrypted data that no one can break. And that's by making sure the keys are never exposed. If the key itself cannot be observed, the key can't be stolen, it can't be captured, the encryption can't be gotten out. And any cryptographer, any mathematician in the world will tell you that the math is sound. The only way to get through encryption on a targeted basis, particularly when you start layering encryption, you're not using one algorithm, you're using every algorithm, you're using key splitting, you're using all kinds of sort of sophisticated techniques to make sure no one person, no single point of failure exists. Uh, there's no way in, there's no way around it. And that's going to continue to be the case, I think, until uh, our understanding of mathematics and physics changes on a fundamental level. I mean, I'll, I'll just add and that. actually, if, 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 I could, if I could follow up on that, I would say the U.S. government's investigation actually supports that. Uh, we've had both public and private acknowledgments that they know at this point neither the Russian government nor the Chinese government nor any other government has possession of any of this information. And that would be easy for them to find out. Remember, these are the guys who are spying on everybody in the world. They've got human intelligence assets embedded in these governments. They've got electronic signals assets in these governments. If suddenly the Chinese government knew everything the NSA was doing, we would notice the changes. We would notice the chatter, we'd see officials communicating, and our assets would tell us, hey, suddenly they, they got a warehouse, they put you know, a thousand of their most uh, skilled researchers in there. That's never happened, and it's never going to happen. I'll just add that I think Ed's right. If the government really wants to get into your computer, if they want to figure out what you're saying and who you're saying it to, they will find a way. But that won't involve breaking the encryption. That'll involve hacking into your device. So whether your phone or your laptop, they'll take advantage of either vulnerabilities that, that haven't been patched or, or, or um, vulnerabilities that no one knows about. Um, but hacking technologies don't scale. Um, if you are a target of the NSA, it's going to be game over no matter what. Um, unless you are taking really, really sophisticated steps to protect yourself, but for most people, that, that'll be beyond their reach. But encryption makes bulk surveillance too expensive. And, and really the goal here isn't to blind the NSA. The goal isn't to stop the government from going after legitimate surveillance targets. The goal here is to make it so that they cannot spy on innocent people because they can. Right now, so many of our communications, our telephone calls, our emails, our text messages, our instant messages are just there for the taking. And if we start using encrypted communication services, suddenly it becomes too expensive for the NSA to spy on everyone. Suddenly they'll need to actually have a good reason to dedicate those resources to either try and break the encryption or to try and hack into your device. And, and so encryption technology, even if imperfect, has the potential to raise the cost of surveillance to, to the point that it no longer becomes economically feasible for the government to spy on everyone. Can we get another question on the screen from Twitter? Please. <laughs> Thanks. OK. Um, good question from David Meyer. Is it possible to reap the benefits of big data on a societal level? while not opening ourselves to constant mass surveillance. Uh, how do we enjoy the scientific benefits, uh, even some of the commercial benefits of this, uh, without turning ourselves into a dystopian surveillance state um, in, in two minutes or less? Ed? This is a really difficult question. Um, there are a lot of advancements in things like encrypted search that would make it possible for the data to be in an unreadable format until you know, a court provides a warrant or something. But in, in general, it's a difficult problem. Uh, the bottom line is data should not be collected without people's knowledge and consent. If data is being clandestinely acquired uh, and the public doesn't have any way to review it, uh, and it's not legislatively authorized, it's not reviewed by courts, it's not consonant with our Constitution, that's a problem. 
so if we want to use that, it needs to be the result of a public debate in which people's, uh, people's voice has been in the Chris, do you want to take on that question? Uh, we, we have another question that is about everyday users. Maybe you can give us another one because I think we've answered this one. Friends backstage? Okay, from Tim Shorrock. Um, wasn't NSA mass surveillance the solution? Chris, can you read that? Wasn't, wasn't NSA's mass surveillance uh, the solution to the internet driven by private privatization and handling over our signals intelligence analysis to SCIC Booz Allen. So Tim is understand. basically saying, you know, it, isn't this a result of letting contractors in to run the show? I think right. So the, the, the problem is when the NSA gets a pot of money, uh, they don't typically develop the solutions themselves. They bring in a bunch of contractors, the Booz Allens, the SAICs, the CACIs, and they go, hey, what can you guys do for us? What solutions are you working on? And these guys give a gigantic song and dance. I actually used to be professional and I know how it works. Um, and the problem is you've got contractors and private companies at that point influencing policy. It, it was not uncommon for me at the NSA as a private employee uh, to write the same point papers and sort of policy suggestions that I did as an official employee of the government at the CIA. And the problem with that is you've got people who aren't accountable. Uh, they've got no sort of government recourse against them who are saying, let's do this, let's do that. Let's put all this money in mass surveillance because it'll be great, we'll all get rich, but it doesn't serve the public interest. One thing you've seen recently is the government's gone and, and changed its talking points. They moved their verbiage away from public interest and to national interest. And we should be concerned about that because when the national interest talking about the state becomes distinct from the public interest, uh, what benefits the people, we, we really are at a point where we have to marry those up or it gets harder and harder to control and, and we lose risking that or we risk losing control of a representative democracy. So, so Ed, maybe let me ask you what will turn out to be a final question. Um, in, in your early interviews with Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras, you said that your, your biggest fear um, was that there would be little or no reaction um, to these disclosures. You know, where you sit now, um, how satisfied are you with the global debate that you helped to launch? Um, and um, uh, do you feel that it was worth the price that you paid in order to bring us to this moment? One of the things that I told Bart Gellman was when I came public with this, uh, it wasn't so I could sort of single-handedly change the government, tell them what to do, and sort of override uh, what the public thinks is proper. What I wanted to do was inform the public so they could make uh, a decision, they could provide their consent for what we should be doing. And the results of these revelations, the results of all the incredibly responsible, careful reporting that, by the way, has been coordinated with the government, and the government's never said any single one of these stories have risked a human life. Uh, the, the result is that the public has benefited, the government has benefited, and every society in the world has benefited in a more secure place, we have more secure communications, and we're going to have a better sort of uh, civic interaction as a result of understanding what's being done in our name and what's being done against us. And so when it comes to what I do this again, the answer is absolutely yes. Uh, regardless of what happens to me, this is something we had a right to. I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution and I saw that the Constitution was violated on massive scales. The interpretation of the Fourth Amendment had been changed in Thank you. The, uh, the interpretation of the Constitution had been changed in secret from uh, no unreasonable search and seizure to, hey, any seizure is fine. Just don't search it. 
And that's something the public ought to know about. You can see behind uh, Ed is a green screen of, is that Article One of the Constitution? Uh, That's correct. <laughs> we the people. Um, there's another organization here that is also interested in the Constitution. I'd be remiss if I didn't say to all of you uh, that the ACLU has a table. Um, it's table 1144. Uh, I promise that it will not be all about surveillance. Um, there will also be marijuana. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so please come and say hi to us. If you're not members of the ACLU, it's cheap to sign up. We have ACLU whistles. Um, we have t-shirts that you can get with membership. You can talk to, to me and Chris a little bit more about the work that we're doing and, and our other ACLU colleagues. Uh, and with that, I'd really like all of us to, to thank Ed Snowden for choosing this venue uh, for this kind of conversation. Thank you all very much. Thank you all.